Welcome to today's Savant Live webinar. Thank you for joining us today. We're discussing maximizing your Social Security benefits. My name is Ryan Monette, and the topic of Social Security has always been important to me as a financial planner and financial advisor because it's always been a part of the three-legged stool metaphor we use when describing the idea that a stable income in retirement consists of Social Security, private pensions, and savings. As we know, pensions are becoming somewhat of a thing of the past as employers look to remove the liability from their books, and the financial markets have been abnormally volatile the past five to six years with almost three recorded bear markets. So, Social Security has really provided stability for soon-to-be and current retirees. Joining me as a fellow financial advisor is Scott Lowey. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us today, and welcome, Scott. Yes, thanks, Ryan. Certainly pleased and honored to be presenting with you today. Uh, I actually joined Savant way back in early 2008 as a financial advisor. I'm housed in the Global World Headquarters Rockford office. And you know, Ryan, as I think back over the 33 years that I've been helping people, you know, their, their second biggest concern and question is really related to Social Security. Will that be there for me? How much will I get? Uh, when should I consider claiming strategies? Um, you know, will the politicians mess it up? Um, so it's a, a great concern to folks. And the first concern, of course, is do I have enough? How long will, will my monies last? But uh, today's topic is always timely. It's always important. And uh, it's not a one size fits all. And uh, what might be good for your neighbor might not be best for you. And certainly look forward to helping provide some clarity with you today. All right, great. Well, appreciate it, Scott. Uh, first off, what we're going to do today is go through a quick uh, disclaimer. Uh, obviously, our presentation is for informational purposes only. And so now that we've gotten the disclaimer out of the way, we can jump into the agenda. For our agenda today, we are going to begin by discussing several of the most important mechanics of the Social Security system. We will then review the various factors that individuals should consider before filing for Social, social Security benefits. We'll review how to weave Social Security into a comprehensive retirement income strategy. We'll then wrap up with an action plan and address your questions. And with that, I'll hand it over to Scott to discuss how the Social Security system works. All right, great. Thank you, Ryan. So a little background. So the Social Security Administration was effectively created by President Roosevelt when he signed into law the Social Security Act way back in August of 1935. And remember, it was never fully designed to fully fund one's retirement, but it provides an, a very important source of income to nearly 71 million retirees for folks who are disabled, as well as surviving spouses. And interestingly enough, the original claiming age was set at age 65, but there was a lot of debate back then that maybe instead they should claim at age 70. And interestingly enough, had that occurred, we wouldn't be having, of course, the solvency issues that we're potentially faced with today. So let's start with the, the big elephant in the room. And that, of course, is, you know, what is the expected longevity? What is, what is the solvency? And frankly, as we sit here today, technically the system is underfunded. So it's very likely that we will see changes coming down the road. Now, there's lots of headwinds, of course. Uh, people are living longer. Uh, many are electing to take their Social Security benefits earlier. There's less people paying in as contrasted with the folks who are pulling monies out. There's higher costs, just generally due to inflation. And we also go through these recessionary periods of time, think the COVID years, in which the payroll tax revenue actually decreases. And it's now expected that the trust fund assets will be exhausted maybe as early as 2033, which really isn't all that far away. And it's at that point when the expected benefit payouts will only be generating 77% of the monies that are actually being kicked out. Now, the good news is there are several ways in which the needle can be moved. So like most things in life, you can either try to figure out how to increase the revenue, uh, think higher taxes, or potentially reduce the benefits, uh, which uh, is, is really a hot potato on the political side. So let's take a look at the revenue. So one strategy might be to potentially increase the payroll tax rate. So currently, all working Americans have 6.2% of their paycheck taken out of their pay automatically and sent into the Social Security Administration. 
Now the employer also is required to match that amount. So there is a total of 12.4% that's flowing in on a regular basis. So one thought might be to increase that percentage from 12.4% to something higher. Clearly that would generate more revenue. However, that would also end up being paid by every working American and thus viewed and rightfully so as a tax increase. So another strategy that's being discussed is to increase what's called the taxable wage base. Now that's the dollar amount on which that 12.4% payroll tax is applied to. So it currently only applies on the first in 2024, $168,600 of earnings. So there are many proposals out there that are suggesting, well, maybe we ought to apply that payroll uh, the social security tax to all earnings. And there's also some proposals that are saying, well, maybe only the higher income earners should pay a little bit more of their fair share. So there's a proposal being bantered about cap it at 168, hit the pause button, but then for higher income earners that make over $400,000, and that's a magic number with our current administration, that that tax would kick back in those social security payments. Now, that would impact, of course, only the higher earning workers, so there would be less complaining voters. But remember, too, that the employer would also have increased costs, and they would probably, of course, try to figure out a way to pass that on to the consumer, so that could potentially result in higher prices, think higher inflation. On the other side of the fence would be potentially reducing the benefits, and, and that's that political third rail, of course, and no one wants to touch it. But there are some proposals that might suggest increasing the full retirement age, currently age 67 for anyone born in 1960 or after, to maybe age 68 or 69, or potentially increasing the maximum delayed benefit age currently at age 70 to maybe 71, 72, or 73. In addition, adjusting the calculation for determining the annual cost of living adjustment has gotten some traction and discussion lately as well. So at this moment, the COLA is tied to the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, um, but any less of an increase, which would help the longevity of the Social Security Administration, would adversely impact those who are, on a, who are on a fixed income, and that wouldn't buy many votes as well. Now, for years, we've been reading about the headlines about Social Security and its future solvency issues. Um, the good news is the system can and it will endure. So as an individual who's um, contemplating their claiming strategy, don't make it based on a hasty decision. Make sure that you're planning Social Security on what we know today, and let's not speculate or predict where it might end up in the future. All right, let's chat a little bit about, uh, you know, how are the ultimate retirement benefits calculated? So you can see in the upper left-hand corner here, um, 40 credits required. So Every quarter that you work and you make approximately $1,700 or more, and that is indexed for inflation, you earn a credit. So to be ultimately eligible to collect Social Security benefits, you need to earn 40 credits or more. So thinking that you have to work for 10 years. Now, the number of credits that you earn does not actually impact the amount of your Social Security benefit that you will end up receiving just whether or not you qualify or not. So Ryan, you know, sometimes we get the question, well, what if I don't have enough credits? What then? Um, well, if you don't have enough credits to claim on your own record, hopefully then you're married and you could potentially then file for spousal benefits and potentially receive up to 50% of your spouse's benefit. But there's certain hoops that you need to jump through in order to qualify for that. 35 highest years. Okay, so what, what's that all about? So here's where your benefit actually gets determined. So your social security benefit is ultimately based on how much you earn over your 35 highest income years. So later in life, uh, the earlier flipping burgers and scooping ice cream drops off, 
And those past wages, interestingly enough, are also indexed for inflation to help ensure that your future social security benefits do reflect that, uh, that rise in the standard of living. All right, the third box on the far right-hand side. We'll get in the weeds a little bit here, so, so bear with me. So what's this Amy and primary insurance PIA all about? So the Social Security Administration uses a rather complex formula, which is really beyond the scope of our discussion today, to actually determine the amount that you will receive at your full retirement age. So the calculation is based on the average indexed monthly earnings, that's that Amy, which looks at your past earnings history, it does adjust it for inflation, and it divides it by the number of months in the years that are ultimately being used in the calculation. So to apply a couple figures to that, so as of 2024, an individual gets credit for 90% of the first approximately $1,200 in your monthly earnings, then 32% of the, of the amount between that $1,200 and approximately $7,000 of your monthly earnings, and then 15% of any amount over that $7,000 monthly earning threshold. So the total of those months is that is what's called that primary insurance amount or PIA. And that is really your full retirement age amount that you will see if you go to the Social Security Administration to check on your benefits. Now, the good news is you don't have to remember that formula. The Social Security Administration will do all of that for you. Now, I've mentioned this full retirement age a couple of times along the way here. And Ryan, in a few minutes, will share what does that specifically mean? Because it's not the same for everyone. So a little teaser there to, to pay attention to, to Ryan's upcoming comments. Uh, just to share some additional figures. So the maximum full retirement age benefit that anyone could receive in 2024 is $3,822 a month. Now that assumes that your 35 highest income years have been at or over that taxable wage base that I mentioned earlier. Now the maximum benefit for someone claiming as early as age 62, because that's when you're uh, first eligible to claim, the maximum benefit that someone would receive at 62 is about $2,700 a month. And then at the other end of the spectrum, if you wait until age 70, the maximum amount is just shy of $4,900 a month or roughly $58,500 a year. So the point is a wide discrepancy between potential claiming strategies between 62 and 70. And Ryan's going to get into some of those details in a moment. So if you're wondering, well, how do you stack up as compared to the average Social Security recipient in 2024? The average amount is $1,907, or roughly a little shy of $23,000 on an annual basis. Now, remember, too, that these benefits are typically adjusted upwards for that COLA or that cost of living increase that I mentioned earlier. So let's take a look at uh, historically what those cost of living increases look like. All right, lots of numbers on this um, on this chart, um, but you can see that the coal has actually started way back in 1975. And prior to that, Congress decided what a recipient's increase would be. So in the fall, just like last fall, um, it was announced that the COLA would be 3.2% effective for all payments starting January 1st of 2024. And it's interesting, when you look at these past figures, over the past 15 years, we've only seen an increase in the COLA above 3%, only four times. So clearly recently, not as good as the 8.7% that everyone enjoyed two years ago, which interestingly enough was the highest percentage going all the way back to the high inflation, high interest rate years, 1981. Now, what you'll also notice on this chart that there are some years, look at 2009, look at 2010, look at 2015. The increase was 0% that year. So it's interesting when you take a look at the, uh, the mathematical average of all of these increases going back to 1975, it averages 3.77%. 
And remember how that magical rule of 72 works. That's that mathematical formula, which helps answer the question, how quickly will something double? So if you're curious at that average, average return of 3.77% that you've enjoyed historically, how long would it take for your social security benefit to double from where it's at currently today? The math would suggest 19 years. All right, a couple other thoughts to, to keep in mind before um, you, you, you turn that uh, spigot on. So the earning test rule. So Ryan and I, you know, we get a fair amount of questions as it relates to what are, what are the details as to if I'm collecting social security, but I'm also working at the same time, what sort of impact might that have? So let's shed a little light on that. So if you're still working and you claim prior to your full retirement age, your benefits, yes, will be reduced. So after you earn approximately $22,000 and change, if you're working, you claim prior to your full retirement age, your benefit will be reduced by $1 for every $2 above that $22,000 threshold. Now the rules change if you happen to be working during the year you reach your full retirement age. So in that case, any earnings above $59,500 approximately is reduced $1 for every $3 over that $59,000 threshold. Now, the good news is after you reach age full retirement age, you can work as much as you want and your social security benefits will never be reduced again. Now, interestingly enough, if you do fall into that category where, whereby your social security benefits are reduced, the Social Security Administration will actually reamortize and recalculate the benefit that you will receive at your full retirement age. So you'll eventually get credit for those months in which you were working, in which your benefits were reduced. All right, the government pension offset and the windfall elimination provision. So um, we'll get in the weeds a little bit here as well, but we get a, a number of questions as it relates to, to these provisions. So certain individuals may have a reduction in their social security benefits because of past work in which they had that they did not pay into the Social Security Administration. So it's very common for teachers, for instance, to fall into that category and even government employees. But on the other hand, they don't pay into the system because they typically receive a pension in return. So when an individual has work, earnings from work where they paid in through into the system and they also worked where they did not, that's where these windfall elimination provisions might apply. So think someone, for instance, that maybe worked in the private sector for a number of years, and then maybe they went on to become a teacher. So um, both of these provisions uh, are fairly complex and not necessarily a topic uh, for our presentation today, but we wanted you to be aware that this might apply to your specific situation. If you do have any questions, we can certainly be available offline to answer and address your specific circumstances. All right, what about taxation? Believe it or not, your social security benefits may end up being taxable to you, all depending on your other income. Now, that might not sound fair because you would say to yourself, well, wait, I've been paying into the system. Now I'm getting my own money back and I've got to include it in income and pay tax on it again. Well, the answer is yes. Um, so if you think you are being taxed twice, yeah, you are correct. So depending on your other income, the amount of your social security benefits that you'll have to include will be either, and there's three different tiers, either 0%, that's good, 50% of your benefits, or 85% of the social security benefits you'll have to include in income. So most fall into that 85% threshold because their provisional income, that's the definition that's used, if that amount, if married filing jointly is over $44,000, then you've got to include 85% of your social security benefits in income and pay tax on, on that at ordinary income tax rates. Provisional income, by the way, is a rather unique definition in the tax code. Provisional income is your gross income plus any municipal income, income that you might earn but don't have to pay uh, federal tax on, plus one half of the social security benefits. 
So um, the good news is Social Security does allow for individuals to have federal income tax withheld from their payments. Uh, that will help ease the burden come April 15th. Um, there's four different tax brackets where bar, or four different withholding levels, excuse me, that you can pick from, either 7%, 10%, 12%, or 22%. All right, coordination with Medicare. A lot of people think that Medicare and Social Security work in lockstep with each other, um, but that's not always uh, necessarily the case. So for instance, Medicare kicks in for everyone at the age of 65. But you might claim Social Security either before age 65 or after age 65. Now, if you do claim after age 65, you're still required to pay the Medicare premium starting at age 65, and you will do, do that by an automatic debit out of your checking account. And then once Social Security kicks in for you, then the Social Security Administration will automatically deduct those Medicare premiums for you. So with that uh, backdrop, uh, Ryan, I'll pass the baton to you to talk in some more details and give some thoughts on different claiming strategies. Well, that's great information for everyone to know, Scott, what you just shared, so appreciate that. Um, there are so many moving pieces and complex rules and it becomes clear that we need to identify the ways in which Social Security can be used to help us meet our goals while keeping in mind the need to focus on what we know and can control. Uh, while changes are likely, I don't think Social Security is going away, so let's not make any hasty decisions about claiming, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and really, this is a nice segue into our next session, discussing, discussing claiming strategies. And you and I both know we had a lot of fun back in our heyday, so to speak, when we had these advanced Social Security claiming strategies that were available to us. Uh, but unfortunately, through the Bipartisan Budget Act passed in 2015, a lot of these cool strategies we used to take advantage of are no longer available. Um, these updates you know, that were made in 2015 through this Bipartisan Budget Act uh, were designed to eliminate so-called aggressive claiming strategies and help reduce deficits in the system. Some of these techniques might sound familiar to those of you listening today. You might have heard of file and suspend or file a restricted application for spousal benefits only. Those were a couple strategies that existed uh, if you were born uh, before uh, 1953. But if you were born after 1953, those are no longer an option for you. Instead, Social Security imposed new deemed filing rules, which basically state that if you apply for any benefit, you are deemed to be filing for all available benefits and can therefore take one benefit now and the other one later. An important distinction about deemed filing is it does not apply to survivor benefits. So if you are happen to be a survivor, a uh, spouse has passed away, uh, there still are a number of advantageous claiming strategies if you're entitled to survivor benefits or X survivor benefits. So if you are, please send us a note afterwards and, and we have a whole lineup of information available to you if that applies to you. All right. So as financial planners, we like to start by thinking about the goal before we think about tactics and strategies. We need to ask, what are we trying to solve for and accomplish? Are we aiming to maximize the total amount of benefits you will receive over your lifetime? Sounds logical, but there's typically a trade-off because you need to defer benefits in order to maximize them. Are we trying to solve for a short-term income shortfall instead? If that's the case, then we need to understand what rules Social Security has in place that allows individuals to start and stop their retirement income benefits. Also, expected longevity also plays a big role in your claiming decision. I've heard many people say, I might not live that long, so I want to take the benefits now. I'm sure, Scott, you've heard that countless times, too. While there might be a few people that know for certain that they have a very short time horizon, the fact is that most people still have a lot of time ahead of them and can't possibly know. So we've got to work through the, that uncertainty on longevity. One of the most common goals people have is to enjoy a sustainable retirement cash flow and not run out of money. If that is your goal, you should be much more worried about living a long time versus living a short time. The best way to afford the things in the future that you purchase today is to have a source of income that increases with inflation, which Social Security retirement benefits do. And simple math tells us that the same cost of living adjustment on a larger dollar amount will produce more dollars. As Scott shared earlier, that 8.7% increase in Social Security retirement benefits in 2022 had a bigger impact in dollars for those retirees that started with a larger benefit amount. 
With that said, your social security claiming strategy should primarily be to protect against a longer than expected life. If you do live a very long time and end up depleting your nest egg, it's important to have the largest possible social security benefit as a safety net to help manage that longevity risk. Lastly, it's important to think about potential spousal and survivor benefits if you are married. We need to shift the focus from your lifetime to total benefits to the total lifetime benefits as a couple. It's not just a single life expectancy we need to think about, but the combined life expectancy. The most common application of this is when we have the higher earner of a couple defer until age 70 to maximize their own benefit and also maximize the amount of potential survivor benefits available to their spouse. But for those individuals looking to maximize income in the short term, there may be a couple strategies available for you too. If an individual claims Social Security before their full retirement age, they will have a 12-month period of time to decide whether they would like to continue receiving the benefits or not. But if they decide not to continue receiving the benefits, they will need to pay back the entire amount received. Doing so treats their future Social Security benefits as if they never took the benefit at the earlier start age. Another potential strategy exists after an individual meets their full retirement age. It's at this point or later that an individual can elect to voluntarily suspend their Social Security benefit and allow it to start earning delayed retirement credits. They can start the benefit back afterwards. It's also important to look at the quantitative data, data associated with Social Security and your claiming strategy. The simplest way to do this is to think about break-even ages. Said differently, at what age do I need to live to in order to maximize my Social Security benefits? According to the IRS and Social Security life expectancy tables, a 62-year-old today is expected to live until about age 86. This chart on the screen shows us the cumulative lifetime benefits of three claiming strategies, age 62, 66, and 70. By plotting the strategy on the chart, we can examine where each strategy crosses over another strategy. If you knew exactly how long you were going to live, this would be the chart you'd reference to pick the optimal claiming strategy. You may have seen different versions of this online as well, and an age 70 claiming strategy typically wins out if you make it to about age 80 or age 81. So if you do live to that average age of 86 or beyond, deferring until 70 could be the clear choice. A simple way in which benefits can increase or decrease is based on the age at which an individual claims them. Individuals claiming on their own benefit can claim as early as age 62 or as late as age 70. Claiming earlier will have a permanent reduction in benefit while claiming after your full retirement age will have a permanent increase in benefit. The chart you see in front of you references the percentage reduction in benefits received if you claim retirement benefits or spousal benefits before your full retirement age. So if you look there, you can see for those of you born in 1960 or later, like me, you can see that you would have a 30% reduction in your benefits if you claimed at the age of 62. And a spouse claiming spousal benefits would have a 35% reduction of the spousal benefit amount. Those are some big reductions that you need to keep in mind before you pull the trigger on claiming your social security benefits. As a financial advisor with access to financial modeling tools that help make the complex a bit simpler, I find that modeling out an entire financial plan and then only changing the social security claiming strategy can provide answers to the big question, when should I file for my social security? The modeling can look at life expectancy. It can look at other sources of income, such as pensions, rental income. It can look at the sale of a business, investable assets and savings, future inheritance, investment returns, inflation, tax rates, and spending goals that might change over time. It takes advanced software to model this effectively. So that is why building an integrated retirement income strategy into your financial plan is so important because there are so many components that we need to consider. Working through a social security claiming strategy is an important part of an individual's or a married couple's financial plan. Using a comprehensive tool that incorporates your spending goals with your resources is crucial to helping you choose a claiming strategy that will help you maximize the funding of your retirement goals. A retirement planning tool like the one we use, Money Guide Pro, provides a big picture overview of the various social security claiming strategies available and the impact on your financial plan. The above chart shows how we can incorporate the financial resources and spending of a household, keeping all inputs and assumptions the same and only adjust when and how social security benefits are claimed. We can then focus on what we call the probability of success to determine which strategy will produce the strongest results. 
On the far left side of this slide, you can see that this would have a higher probability of success meeting their spending goals in retirement if they elected to defer claiming Social Security to age 70. This is noted by the probability of success of 85% there on the chart. And we compare that to the other claiming strategies which show a lower probability of success. So having tools like this certainly makes it a lot easier for us to help. When building out a retirement income strategy, we like to look at all sources available to meet spending needs. This can include retirement accounts like 401ks and IRAs, Roth IRAs, or even brokerage accounts. We also include cash assets or other sources of fixed income like a pension or income from real estate. Accounting for all assets and income can help us design a cash flow strategy that allows us to model various social security claiming strategies. Claiming social security benefits early will allow for investable assets to continue to grow. This can be beneficial when an individual believes their assets can grow at a faster pace than the increases earned when delaying social security. Or perhaps somebody who has a short life expectancy would prefer to make sure they leave a legacy for loved ones. Claiming Social Security later may allow for strategic planning opportunities like Roth conversions. Using the chart to the side here, we can explain to a household where their resources will come from to meet their spending goals in any given year in the future. In this example, the household elects to delay claiming Social Security, which is the dark blue bars there. Instead, they start by spending their part-time income, the yellow bars, and they use distributions from their investment portfolio, the light blue bars, to make ends meet early in retirement. Then they start Social Security because of the delay in benefits, and it nearly allows them to stop their distributions from their investment portfolio altogether. Designing an integrated retirement income strategy is a necessary step in the financial planning process, and Social Security is at the heart of the analysis. So I'd like to turn it back over to you, Scott, for a couple of final thoughts. All right, great. Thanks, Ryan. And, and for the record, uh, my full retirement age is 67 as well, but I'm a lot closer to that 1960 birth year than you are. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks, Ryan, you know, for explaining that, that coordinated approach. Certainly a lot of value uh, to be generated when we really take a look at that comprehensive uh, perspective. So, you know, we've armed uh, you with lots of information so far, and the next critical step is, all right, how do we put all of this into action? So what are the next steps? What, you, what, what should you do? So if you haven't already, um, please go into ssa.gov and create your account. Um, it's relatively easy to do. And this is where you will be able to see all of your past earnings history. And you wanna make sure that the Social Security Administration has that right, because ultimately you need to get credit for all the money that you've paid into the system and all of that will be reported there for you. So next, you want to take an inventory of all the other benefits that might be available to you, like either spousal benefits or ex-spousal benefits, or maybe survivor benefits or even ex-survivor benefits. The Social Security website is a, is a pretty good source of information as well. Then, when you, then you ought to take a look and analyze all the options, determine where that break-even point is for you. Again, Ryan indicated somewhere maybe 80, 81, 82. Um, and then which strategy is best based on your circumstances to maximize your total lifetime benefits. And then finally, as Ryan indicated, it's critically important. You need to integrate the social security into this comprehensive plan that weaves in taxes, takes your other investments into account, as well as any other income sources that you may have as well. So um, if you're looking for more detailed information, please visit with your Savant Financial Advisor and we'll help you sort through all those important details. All right, so here's the uh, the public service announcement uh, of the day provided at, at no extra charge. So recently the Social Security Administration announced that they've been seeing an increase in some scamming attempts. So they recently distributed the following information that we would like to pass on as well. And in fact, last week, March 7th, uh, it was proclaimed Slam the Scammer Day by the Social Security Administration. So first and foremost, you wanna recognize the scammers. So it's always important to make sure you keep your guard up whenever you receive any unsolicited communication, whether it's by phone, whether it's by me email or by text, uh, they will try to soft pressure you into taking action and somehow get you to provide uh, confidential information to help you part with your money. So 
Um, also important to help avoid the scam. Brian, if we can jump to the next slide, please. Um, so clearly if your phone rings or you get the email, you know, remain calm. If it comes in by phone, hang up on any unsolicited calls. If it's important, they, uh, they'll certainly call you back. Um, you need to protect your money. You need to protect your personal information. Spread the word when you share any information to family, friends, and neighbors. Um, that will help everyone else get their guard up as well. Now, if you have been scammed um, and it does happen, don't be embarrassed. You're not the first that has happened to. And uh, there are reporting mechanisms in place and even the Social Security Administration has one as well. So they have a link where you can report this to the Social Security Office of the Inspector General. And again, all this information was recently distributed from uh, the Social Security Administration as a reminder to all of us to make sure you protect your privacy, uh, keep your guard up, and don't succumb to, to the bad actors. That concludes the, the prepared comments that Ryan and I had for you today. So with that, uh, we would like to move on to some questions that maybe we've received with a few minutes that we have remaining. Um, and Ryan, I'm already seeing a, a, a few of these in the chat. So how about I take the easy ones and, and you get the tricky ones? <laughs> right, thanks, Scott. I appreciate it. All right. Um, here's one that I'm seeing, Ryan, um, and one that I didn't address that, that, that's kind of, a, of, of interest. So um, the question is, at, at one time, there was consideration to invest Social Security taxes in the financial markets. Will this ever happen? So think privatization of the of the Social Security Administration. And you know, I didn't really, I didn't specifically address this topic when I was discussing you know the longevity or or the solvency of of the Social Security Administration. But it's actually a good question that does crop up every now and then. And usually the discussion occurs you know right after we we've, we've had some good positive results in the in the financial markets. But um, under current law, the requirement is that those dollars have to be and can only be invested in U.S. Treasuries. So any proposals that are out there would um, actually result in potentially more riskier investments. There have been a number of proposals that would invest in low-cost mutual funds for at least a portion of those dollars. Again, all in an effort to try to continue the longevity of the Social Security Administration. We all know that historically, investing in the market will provide greater return over time, not necessarily in the short period. But um, clearly, that would have to be a bipartisan congressional effort to, uh, to change the rules on how those monies are indeed invested. Wow. Well, I'm all for that. I could help out. <laughs> so another question came in. The question is, with the Social Security cost of living adjustment increase, what impact does that have on my Medicare premium increases? And so while it's related specifically to Medicare, it's also tied to Social Security. As cost of living adjustments apply to Social Security benefits, the Medicare Part B premium also increases. So last year, we saw a 6% increase or $9.80 to the now $174.70 that you pay in the base tier for your Part B Medicare premium in 2024. So these premiums are typically deducted from an individual Social Security check. And it's a good example of the, you know, the government giveth and then they quickly taketh away. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that, Ryan. Um, I'm looking at our clock here and uh, wanting to be respectful of, of everyone's time. Um, for those of you who, who have submitted questions, uh, we will circle back with each one of you individually and we'll give you a, a detailed response as, as best we can. Um, but do wanna leave you with a, a couple final thoughts here. And uh, when you're at your cocktail party this weekend, we'll leave you with a little trivia question as it relates to social security. Um, uh, Cause this is kind of a, an, an, an interesting, interesting couple comments here. So. Way back when, the very first recipient of Social Security dollars was a lady by the name of Ida Mae Fuller. She started collecting benefits at the age of 65, way back in January of 1940. Now, Ida lived to be 100 years old, and over the course of her working career, she paid in a total of $24.75. Now, 
Her initial monthly check at the age of 65 was $22.54. So over the course of her lifetime, she collected a total of almost $23,000 in social security benefits. So the moral of this story is that the social security administration has really been challenged going all the way back to, to day one. So in conclusion, uh, hopefully some of you picked up a few tidbits today of, of some knowledge uh, that maybe you didn't have, or we reinforced some thoughts that you did. Um, we certainly appreciate your time. And if you're looking for more information about Savant Wealth Management and what we do, we invite you to visit savantwealth.com. On behalf of Ryan, myself, and Team Savant, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy day. And with that, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.